where are you? And I'm so sorry. Sorry. I'm sorry. UFOs have been coming up in uh, conversation pretty often. And, uh, you know, if you were if you were of a certain generation decades back, you would have listened to Blink-182 with no idea how deep they got into UFOs. You, you wouldn't believe it. Uh, th- it. This is such a wild ride. Uh, again, still 2018. This is around the time when UAP was starting to come become a big thing, right? We were getting some of the first naval footage right around this time. Tom DeLong comes out. He's got this new thing. This is all exciting. And now I want to say he's kind of, I don't know, guys. What he's do you the think? guy. He's the guy. He cracked the case for all intents and purposes. Things that he discovered through his organization, uh, what is it, To the Stars Academy, and various people that did trust him and spoke to him. Um, certain things have come to light. Yeah. You can thank the, the guy that's saying, don't waste your time on me. You're already the ghost inside my head. And, guys, we're joined with a special guest for this episode. That's right. John Goforth, a uh, good pal of ours uh, from a show called Hysteria 51. Uh, and we we kick it with John and we examine uh, as objectively as we could in 2018 the idea of Tom's new mission. Uh, and this is sort of a time capsule episode, folks. We would We would love to hear what you think uh, about this in 2023. Uh, so tune in and also, you know, write to us if, uh, an alien contacts you. (laughs) And Hey, let's go ahead and do it right now, guys. Shout out to Tom. Hey, Tom, Mr. DeLong, I guess if, if you're around and want to talk about this stuff, we'd love to actually have a chat with you. From UFOs to psychic powers and government conspiracies, history is riddled with unexplained events. You can turn back now or learn the stuff they don't want you to know. Welcome back to the show. My name is Matt. Noel is on adventures. But will be rejoining us at some point in the future. In the meantime, they call me Ben. We are with our super producer, Paul Deccan. Most importantly, you are you and you are here. And that makes this stuff they don't want you to know. Matt. Yes. Now, you're... A musician. That's something that longtime listeners are aware of, right? Correct. And I can I can vouch for him, friends and neighbors. He is a cracker jack percussionist. Do people... I'm no Travis Barker, but I am <laughs> I am fairly good at what I do, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I'm a big fan personally. And it's strange because rock and roll, since we we mentioned Travis Barker, drummer of Blink 182, mm-hmm. right? Uh, rock and roll occupies such a unique niche in the American zeitgeist, in our culture, in our history, and on and on and on. Uh, there's another thing that seems very American in our culture, and that's the concept of UFOs, right? Oh, sure. <laughs> yeah, I mean, we have all this vast land, like land out in the West that's just devoid of anything but military bases and flying objects that we don't know what they are. And weirdos. <laughs> <laughs> there are a lot of people and cool things out there too, uh, and wildlife. But, you know, things going around in the sky that blink. Mm-hmm. That That's my favorite part of it, at least. <laughs> so today we are exploring some strange facets of this zeitgeist in a way that is, full disclosure, uh, mm kind of new to us, but we are not sallying forth into this territory alone. No, ladies and gentlemen, today we are joined by a very special guest, a friend of the show, who is going to provide some cognitive firepower, some intellectual ammunition to today's exploration, and we'd like to let the badger out of the bag and introduce him in person now, friends and neighbors, skeptics, and fellow conspiracy realists alike, presenting John Goforth. The intellectual part you might have overstated, but uh, I'll do my best. <laughs> oh, don't be silly. John Goforth, I'm gonna just going to say this right now. He is the host of Hysteria 51, one of the co-hosts of Hysteria 51. 
the, not the best. I mean, not, I wasn't going to say the best one, but my I, favorite one. Definitively not the best one. There's three of us. <laughs> it's myself, my my co-host, Brent Hand, and then our, our third co-host is an angry robot bent on world domination named Conspiracy Bot, but he normally doesn't succeed because he's too busy drinking. Yeah. And, and we have a clip of Conspiracy Bot that some of you may recognize. Stay woke, meet sex. He always says that. He does. He I, does. I, it makes me wonder about, you know, you guys aligning yourself with such a character. Hmm. We uh, built him to help ed- edit and produce the show, and unfortunately he spends most of his time just drinking and spending our money. Oh, um, man. Yeah, that's uh, my uh, my Amazon Alexa is like that. <laughs> if you can't tell, we uh, <laughs> we are – we uh, while we do focus on conspiracy theories and mysteries, the unusual, UFOs, the unexplained – uh, we certainly um, also are rooted a bit in comedy. <laughs> sure. <laughs> and so we try to get our facts right, but we have a lot of – try to have a lot of fun doing it, much like you guys do. Yeah. Oh, thank you. We're flattered. And thank you for coming on the show today, John. When we're talking about this off air, we – we're originally kicking around some ideas collectively and we were thinking, well, what would we what would we like to explore in our time together today? And the thing that we all kept running into was the fascinating story of disclosure. The the concept is going to be familiar to a lot of listeners of Hysteria 51, a lot of listeners of stuff they don't want you to know, but it may also – sound very vague and foreboding and uh, mysterious or maybe just vague to quite a few people. So maybe we start today's episode by looking at the facts. First, this concept, disclosure. What is it exactly? How would you phrase it? Uh, Simply the the reveal of of classified information that the US – that the United States government – is in possession of, uh, typically as it relates to extraterrestrials having visited this Earth. Okay, so then this concept would be separate categorically from, say, proven events that were classified and later disclosed, like the Tuskegee syphilis experiments, or say MK Ultra or something. Right. Uh, I think typically when we. In, in the in the paranormal, the UFO, mysterious universe, talk about disclosure, we're talking about something that hasn't happened yet and that many are looking forward to and believe will happen one day. Yeah, disclosure has been imminent since I've known about disclosure. And <laughs> yes. that's been about 15 years for me since I like understood what it meant. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Also a great Michael Douglas flick. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. But I like that you say it's always eternally imminent. It's like Iran getting the bomb. It's like the the, rapture or the characters in Alice in Wonderland finally getting jam, right? Mm. It's always on the cusp of occurring but hasn't quite occurred. Matt, you said something really interesting. Uh, Oh, did I? For years it's been imminent because you (laughs) you listed a specific number of years. Oh, well, that's just since I've known uh, about it. However, when I – when it first like popped on the radar – I was still in I was still in high school and uh, it was in 2001 and there was this this big gathering at the National Press Club with all of these people that were experts mm-hmm. in their fields most of them from the military uh, ex military like retired uh, gentlemen and they all came forward and gave their personal stories about experiencing something that they considered a UFO that they believe was probably in their opinion, of extraterrestrial origin, some of them. Was that the Stephen Greer event? That is the Stephen Stephen Greer event. Uh, okay, yeah. yeah. Dr. Stephen Greer. Yes. Apologies. Mm. Yes, yes. Who uh, we and, interviewed on a previous episode. Yeah, and we, we talked about some of that at length. Um, that moment in 2001 is when I think a lot of people really started – understanding, oh my gosh, there is, there could be something here because it gave such legitimacy to it with the the characters that were involved. And that kind of thing has happened a few more times over the years. Mm-hmm. And, you know, it, it certainly feels like there might be something if there's something happening soon. Right. Or is it uh, just another series of examples uh, showing us how effective resorting to authoritative titles can be. You know what I mean? That's the that's a Bernays tactic 
from the days of yore, just make something that sounds imperious enough, have someone, for like, for instance, if you heard some schmuck named Ben Bolin said that it turns out bacon is bad for you or that gluten will cause you to grow webs between your fingers, then who's that guy? What the heck does he know? But if it's like Dr. Ben Bolin, uh, PhD, the third, whatever, you add these stylings on, you know, and you add this association with these highly credible organizations, then it becomes easier to accept whatever they say. I don't know. I'm. I, I, I think you're right. In this instance, in this specific instance, these were people with actual biographies, with mm. actual credentials. Which, and it, yeah. you know, it wasn't just some guy. It, w- it was actual people that you could look up. And even even before then, there have been examples of disclosure either happening or um, supposedly happening yes. mm-hmm. or not happening when it was expected. I mean, going back all the way to Project Blue Book. Yes. I'm really glad you mentioned Thank that. You. Yeah. Uh, so Project Blue Book, which I'm sure is very familiar to a lot of people, it was one of a larger umbrella of studies launched by the U.S. government, specifically the military and air force, to investigate unidentified aerial phenomena. So not necessarily a craft, not necessarily an alien. Could have been anything from a balloon to a strange cloud to ball lightning to weird-looking bird. Uh, But they spent years doing this, correct? And they didn't identify everything. Started in 52, ended in 69. Mm -hmm. And (laughs) they came out and said afterwards, don't worry about it, nothing to see here. (laughs) <laughs> uh, yeah. After all of our studying, it, was, it basically it was swamp gas. Yeah. Right. And there were some previous iterations of Blue Book and post iterations of it, but nothing was ever taken as seriously as Blue Book was. I don't – at least not that um, that I've ever found. Not that's been – Disclosed? Oh, oh, there we go. <laughs> I think we, I, I think we earned that one yeah. at this point. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So Blue Book had thousands of reports that they sifted through, and in the end, most of them were somehow explained, at least to their satisfaction. But they still didn't explain everything, and that is a fact that would tantalize and haunt people who believe in the extraterrestrial origin of UFOs for decades to come. Because again, 1969, from what, 52 to 69, you said? Yeah. That's a long, long time. It, spe- is. it It makes you wonder if they weren't finding anything, if everything was so worthless, then why did it continue for so long? Hmm. The same could be said for MK Ultra. You know, the, uh, the, there there are there are so many uh, Project Stargate when yes. they were looking at you know um, uh, remote, remote viewing. viewing. Yeah. Uh, why did these things go on for decades if nothing was coming of it? Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, I mean, you got to spend that budget somehow so that you can get that budget plus more next year. It's- Welcome to our uh, our bureauc- <laughs> bureaucracy, right? Because otherwise, they'll that that is a true story that Matt is referring to, or a true a true uh, phenomenon that occurs, right? Mm-hmm. It's it's unfortunately a fact that in many cases, especially in government organizations, if the entirety of a budget is not spent by the end of the fiscal year, yeah. then it will be cut to the amount that was spent. Yeah. And, you know, there, we were talking about Blue Book. They said there was nothing to see here. There's a mo- much more recent example, mm. much more recent than Stephen Greer, that they said there is something to see here. Yes. And this was kind of mind-boggling to me that, they, um, that we found out about the, the, the black money uh, project on the side uh, that the Pentagon had going on, the Advanced Aviation Threat Identification or ATIP program mm. uh, headed by Luis Elizondo. And Luis left the program and then went public with it, along with video that the Department of Defense released from a 2004 encounter uh, near San Diego of two Navy FA-18s. Um, I don't want to say dueling, but um, dancing with a unknown object that was moving, um, according to Elizondo, in ways that are not currently possible uh, with anything that we have in our inventory in the U.S., or any foreign inventory that we're aware of. Yeah, yeah. And the reason it's important to point out that these were two pilots is because they were using identical 
uh, sensory systems. They were coming from different positions, and they were seeing things that correlate both mm-hmm. with their own eyewitness experience, which, as we know, is relatively worthless a lot of times. More importantly, with their computer systems. Yeah, there there's a lot of signals intelligence that you're getting from that uh, from that video. And we actually interviewed Jeremy Corbell, one of the people that was working to. I guess, disclose some of that stuff Mm -hmm. and get it out there. And if you are interested in like learning that full story, just look up how the U.S. secretly tracked UFOs with Jeremy Corbell and you can find that episode. Have you guys ever done anything uh, on Hysteria about that specific program? As you know, in this world, a lot of uh, different stories and topics overlap and touch. Mm -hmm. And we've touched on it on a few episodes. Gotcha. But we're actually uh, in the coming – month or so going to be releasing a two-parter on just generalized disclosure and that will that will certainly be part of it. Beautiful. Something to look forward to, right? Oh, yes. And what we were establishing here with this rough timeline, this, uh, this, this quick look at the highlights of disclosure is that while it may sound like a thing that occurred in the past or a matter of all smoke, no flame, the fact of the situation – is that this is continuing in some way today. Uh, There will be people who tell you that disclosure as a concept will ultimately only reveal uh, advanced aircraft that are entirely mundane and earth-made and that they're just being held back as a matter of national security. You'll also hear people saying, uh, no, not only have extraterrestrials for some reason, landed on Earth and decided to keep it a secret, but they're actually in charge of things. Mm. And they figured the most direct way to break the news to us would be a gradual program of showing us various tropes in fiction. Yeah. Makes perfect sense. What I like is how straightforward it is. (laughs) <laughs> well, yeah, and uh, and having very popular musicians write songs like track three off of Blink-182's Enema of the State, Aliens Exist. You know, I'm glad you brought that up, Matt. This might seem like a switch in conversation, <laughs> but I think this has been on uh, our collective mind uh, for a for some time. But I don't know a whole lot about Blink-182. Can you guys break it down for me? I remember some of the songs. Where to start? Uh, so uh, three <laughs> members of the band. Yeah. Um, uh, there's Mark Hoppus. Mm-hmm. There's uh, the aforementioned Travis Barker. Mm-hmm. And then uh, a former member uh, is named Tom DeLong. Oh, he quit. Uh, he is no longer a part of that's true. He, so he's, he's left a couple of times. Oh, he's left and he's come – he's returned? Mm-hmm. Oh, well, I guess success and fame can lead to rocky relationships at times. So it, It's true. Many a band. Well, and also cra- uh, plane crashes. Travis Barker, yeah. on a side note, almost died in a plane crash and oh. walked away from it. He was one of the only two survivors. Yeah. Holy smokes. I had no idea. Uh, yeah. He's the one who's covered with tattoos, right? That's correct. Yes, the drummer. Look how unplugged I am. My knowledge of pop culture goes to about the late 1800s. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, <laughs> the the whole Tom DeLonge leaving thing, there are some stories about painkiller addiction that he was probably going through at the time. But he also, you know, he had a family and some of the other – one of the other members I think had a family and it was like that old – that age-old story of a band – getting really big and touring all the time, but then having a family and how do I spend time with them and still mm. be on tour making all this ridiculous amount of money? The, and they the, – the, I've, I've seen them actually a, a few times mm-hmm. uh, when they were a fully formed band. And, yeah. Well, I mean, what a great band. Yeah. Uh, some, of, some of the great uh, – I, I think you mentioned before, uh, you know, pop punk yeah. uh, anthems of, uh, of their generation. Mm-hmm. Yeah, man. Very, I mean, very catchy songwriting and and well-written stuff, uh, from what I'm aware. One thing I did learn about them off-air was uh, that I think the guitarist, Tom DeLonge, was replaced by a guitarist from the Alkaline Trio, if you remember them. Is that when they were playing in – I know they made like a super group at some point. I think it was called 44 or something to that effect. But there was a super group after Tom left. And it was pretty awesome too. Oh no, that 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 band was great. But I, I think what Ben's talking about is literally they are touring as Blink One Eighty Two. Yeah, 
minus Tom DeLonge plus the guy from Alkali Trio. Oh, Ooh. I didn't know that. I, they're literally playing Riot Fest in Chicago this coming uh, uh, fall. Holy mackerel. I didn't know that. Are you going to go? I, I I go to Riot Fest every year. Nice. Uh, it's my favorite uh, <laughs> concert uh, uh, festival. Do it. So why are we talking about yeah. this guy so much? <laughs> yeah, so some people may think, and quite reasonably so, that we have uh, taken one of our – Long and not uncommon tangents into pop <laughs> culture. However, that is not entirely true. We're doing this for a reason. So the next question is, what do these two things, Disclosure and Blink-182, have in common? We'll tell you after a word from our sponsor. <laughs> Here's where it gets crazy. It turns out that disclosure in its most extreme form, that being the concept of extraterrestrial contact with humanity and the famous pop punk band Blink-182 do have a connection, a real one, a vital one that continues today. Yes. The, uh, the aforementioned Tom DeLonge. <laughs> <laughs> ding, ding. Hole in one, John. Thank you. So what uh, – what what happened? How did Tom DeLong become involved in this concept? Well, if you, according to Tom, yes. he's been interested and involved in this concept since he was a small lad, yeah, uh, and uh, and 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 was in, always looked to the heavens and wondered what was out there. Then, yeah, yeah. as as Blink One Eighty Two started touring, uh, obviously this is pre um, iPad or anything like that. Uh, he needed a way to kill all the time in the tour bus because they weren't flying anywhere yet. So he read every alien UFO-related conspiracy book that he could lay his hands on. And that that thus began his lifelong obsession with uh, extraterrestrials and UFOs. OK. So this – he's not a Johnny-come-lately. He has been heavily invested in this. Yes. He read a lot. He read a lot. A fan, a huge fan, I think, yes. one, one could say, um, an enthusiast. But he's not an expert, right? So, like, there's a difference between somebody who, in a field, has been studying something like physics and then you, you know, become a, a physics expert. With ufology, it's a little difficult, right? Because mm -hmm. you can really – I mean, you can look to the heavens as much as you want, try and take data as much as you can, see if you can have an experience of a UFO over time, learn about it that way. Or you can just read the accounts of other people who have experienced UFOs um, or believed to have experienced UFOs. So it's difficult to even become an expert in something like that. And I don't mean to throw shade at Tom. It's just he's, he's an enthusiast, not an expert. Well, there's a difficult – there's a difficult pickle there because there is no – well, I, I don't want to spoil an idea for an upcoming episode. But it's a great question. How does one become a ufologist? Is there an accredited program at a school? Is there a, some sort of you know, apprenticeship to uh, journeyman to master kind of tradition of education? The truth of the matter is at this point – there's not one, at least not one that everyone agrees upon. So therefore, the closest things to a ufologist would be things like an astronomer because that sort of educational hierarchy exists. Or it would be uh, someone who is accepted by other people who consider themselves ufologists as one of their own. You know, yeah, I don't know. I was, I was reading the back of a comic book and uh, <laughs> for the low, low price of $299, I, I could send away for an accreditation. So. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Oh, that's great. So, and, I, and I think that's obviously universally um, sure. renowned and accepted. So. Yeah, the universal life UFO church. <laughs> yeah. hey, um, I'm also ordained. Yeah, yes. me too. Me Who too. is not ordained? <laughs> got a table full of ministers here. Hey, Paul, are you ordained with the Church of Universal Life yet? Oh, Paul said no. Okay. But well, I, I, I would say I think the closest thing would be an aeronautics expert. Sure. So, someone, yeah. someone who studies things that fly around already or builds them or, mm -hmm. you know, knows the physics to a T about that stuff. Yeah, an aerospace engineer. Yeah. I completely agree. And I think the root of that, like in all seriousness, is 
having a science backed approach to it. Mm-hmm. Um, so many are um, uh, armchair experts that that do it from from a Google search, yeah. from a Wikipedia search, and then claim to be ufologists. It, it, it takes a, a big thing that we like to talk about on our show is: Are we applying in one way, shape, or form? the scientific method to this. Mm-hmm. Obviously, a, a sighting isn't repeatable, but there are other things that are repeatable. And and can we look through that prism? Um, and I think, to me, that's the closest I get to looking at someone and saying, yeah, I like that title for that person. Hmm. Right, right. Uh, are the results reproducible? If so, to what degree? Are we exercising – which of the C's are we exercising? Critical thinking or confirmation bias? Mm. Right. And it's it's tough to see those because often, oddly enough, in the heat of the moment or in the heat of a, a passionate belief, people will conflate the two, right? So if person A doesn't agree with person B's confirmation bias, then to person B, person A is not executing critical thinking because of course it's true. Open your eyes. Sheeple. Sheeple. Yeah, which I know sounds a little bit mm, – a, a, a little bit uh, dismissive on my part. But I, I think it's important for us to say that. And it's also f- important for us to note that Tom DeLong has not just been, you know, occasionally – popping off at interviews saying, I quit Blink-182 because I'm interested in reading about something. He has, to his credit, uh, put his money where his mouth is, as the old saying goes, and he's not just reading books. He is act- He's become an activist by his own account. And according to numerous statements, he is actually following through with activism, but in, in what way? Like what specifically sticks out for us uh, as far as what he has done? Well, just like we were talking about with, with experts and bringing it back to that, Ben, he he has surrounded himself by a group of uh, what he calls his core team and created a brand new company called To The Stars Academy of Arts and Sciences, <laughs> which, you know, I saw your face, John, when, when I said that. <laughs> <laughs> tell, let's talk, tell me a little bit about that. Just your face in general. <laughs> yeah, so uh, I, it's very in, it's it's interesting. No mm-hmm. matter where you fall on it, it's interesting. Um, basically, uh, to try to, to I, I mean, I I could read you the entire mission statement of To the Stars Academy, but everybody would tune out. Um, I think to to uh, take it down to brass tacks through. Um, Various pop culture they will produce, whether mm. it be books, TV series, movies, they are going to be begin the slow process of disclosure, only you're not going to realize it because this will be done through fiction. For instance, his first book that's already been released, Secret Machines. With a K. With a K. Um, lots of hidden meaning there. Uh, he, went, he, he would tell you. Um and, and and but they were going to tell real stories through these fictional avenues, mm-hmm. and uh, and then and then throughout that process, we'll also via social media um, be releasing pieces of information, documents, videos that also help correspond with the disclosure. So basically, he's saying, "Hey, we're going to fool you until you actually understand the truth." But I'm going to tell you beforehand that we're going to fool you. <laughs> yeah. It's a very um, bizarre uh, – I wouldn't exactly say straightforward way to go about right. it. Right. Yeah, it's interesting. And as as you said, John, anyone can read their mission statement in full. The common threads through their mission statement are the following. The first is the belief that there is some greater truth and that it is – extraterrestrial in nature rather than an unidentified mundane uh, construction of earthlings or rather than an existing uh, but weird natural phenomenon. They're saying, yes, aliens will tell you by fooling you. And the second thing is the huge, uh, huge certitude that the primary reason this information has not been revealed to the public falls on the shoulders of the government, if not through malevolence, through incompetence in terms of prioritization and bureaucracy, a.k.a. red tape. 
He, uh, but he does make a point to let everyone know that while bureaucracy exists, there is a reason that it has not been disclosed to us yet. Mm -hmm. And when we find out, we're basically all going to fall on our knees and thank them for having not told us sooner. Yeah. The, the government is doing a greater good for us. Yeah, yeah, that's uh, that is an interesting angle too because that's an uncommon very angle, right? So so how did he figure that out? How did how did Tom DeLong, guitarist, famous, filthy rich guitarist, figure out that? Well, for uh, I do want to point out one thing. Okay. We, keep, we keep saying UFOs. Yeah. Um, oh, he hates that. We, he hates yeah, that yeah, term. Yeah. They are advanced aerial threats. Oh, okay. A I, AATs? Yes. Yep. Okay. And also that while extraterrestrials have been here, um, some of our reports are things basically using their technology. We have built our own AATs. Mm -hmm. uh, for instance, Roswell was constructed here on Earth by humans – the the, the 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 by the, Germans by Ger yeah, correct yes mm -hmm. by Germans thank you, um, and but we, that was us using their technology, uh, but the way he found out about it was as he was looking into this and doing all of his reading, he started writing secret machines, and some some deep throat type characters reached out to him. While he's touring, like during the major parts of Blink-182's touring world. <laughs> they reached out to him and mm. said, L we need to meet. And it's going to be very cloak and dagger. Uh, I believe one of the quotes was, let's meet by the Pentagon. Yep. That's very – hey, isn't uh, that the world's largest office building? I believe – yeah. It be. <laughs> probably is. I don't know. It's just – it feels <laughs> like it would be difficult to just go there and see who's standing by it. Well, and which which side do you go by? Google. <laughs> drive me by the Pentagon. <laughs> I don't think it will take you very far. Yeah. Uh, but um, but yes, yeah, so this this is all true. He, he said that it was, uh, as you described, very cloak and dagger. In fact, I believe he doesn't have – or cannot give many more specifics. Yeah, it's kind of a classic story that we've heard from several other people who have this kind of thing, um, especially when there's a book for sale where you can't disclose specifics about a certain secret knowledge that you have that is somewhat contained in your book, but you got to buy it before you can know it. Um, it works well together that way. Yeah, and you know, I don't want to. I don't want to go there quite yet, but that. That's a kind of a trend we might see a little bit later on. But um, he did say that he ended up taking high-level meetings all around Washington, D.C. with all kinds of different people. He ended up meeting with generals that he would say, yes, it's a general. Um, but he would not mention specifics to protect himself and these individuals that he's talking to is what he stated. He ended up having a two-hour meeting at NASA's Ames Research Center where he was introduced to another person. So he's kind of – ping-ponging back and forth between all these different people who are each connecting him up with somebody else. So moving through a, um, a relatively obscure network. Yes, yep. which is a very similar story to what Stephen Greer told us mm -hmm. is how he ended up getting into a lot of this stuff, you know, as a medical professional, then all of a sudden, you know, becoming one of the most well-known uh, ufologists out right. there. And and a theme to Tom's story is that as he gets these introductions and has these meetings, he goes down deeper down the rabbit hole, mm -hmm. meaning he says something and that leads him to be contacted by somebody even more secret. And uh, and when asked on um, on Joe Rogan's podcast, when asked, well, why, 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 like, what were you saying that was so intriguing to them? And he goes, well, I just put it all together. From all that reading I was telling you guys about, mm -hmm. I just put it all together. I, I saw how the pieces all fit together. So basically he read a bunch of Jim Mars books and somehow did the, did the whole writing on the window thing and, and, and poof, got the whole view of the UFO phenomenon on this earth. Had a larger vision. Correct. Yeah. And maybe 
from that perspective, if we were to take that at face value, the argument is like that old anecdote of the elephant, right? People are identifying various parts of the animal. I think we talked about mm-hmm. this in previous mm-hmm. shows. And someone touches the leg. They think it's a tree that they found. Someone touches the nose. They think it's a snake. And in this analogy, Tom DeLong is the first one to say, holy smokes, that's an elephant. Well, and you might think to yourself – Oh, come on. That's ridiculous. You might also think to yourself, oh, yeah, exactly. Just depending on what, you know, where your belief system is currently. Um, You know, it's easy to kind of poke fun at, I guess, in a way. But there perhaps there is a world in which a single individual put the right pieces together in some way that an intelligence official somewhere decided, oh, wow, maybe maybe this guy, maybe we need to control this guy or maybe we need to talk to this guy or maybe there's some way we can use him. Um, because there's a weird thing that happened, John. Do you From that Joe Rogan interview, do you remember like one of the major things he said? Yeah, after having had, after having had some of those classified meetings, he was at an airport and a a, uh, a gentleman in, in, I guess, you know, kind of typical black trench coat mm-hmm. type garb sat down next to him and said, we need to talk. He's, okay. Um, and basically goes on to tell him that during the Cold War, we literally, we being the United States, got an extraterrestrial body. And he goes on to to tell Tom that story. And that, I think that's actually where Tom said, um, well, the reason they – they 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 picked me is because I, mm-hmm. I saw the forest through the tree mm-hmm. and would would understand and and be able to process all of this. Mm-hmm. So they found living evidence of an extraterrestrial organism, a life form, and then again, this is a conversation in public in an airport, and the unidentified man f- follows up too. Right? He doesn't just tell Tom this kind of confirmation of this discovery. He he takes it a step further. Right. Yeah, the, uh, allegedly the man asked him what he needs. Like, what do you need, son, to, to to do whatever it is you're trying to do? And Tom replied, well, I need advisors. Takes a village, right? Yes. And boy, howdy, did he get some advisors. Uh, there's a long list of people. We can hit some of the major players, I guess. Mm-hmm. Well, uh, Tom goes on to say – that one of the people that he started conversations with was John Podesta, mm. who was a former advisor to President Cl- Cl- President Clinton, yeah. um, and and then also a campaign head for Hillary Clinton. Yes, right. He, right. he also worked with the, the Obama administration, you, and uh, and then and then you know he mentioned generals earlier. Here's here's a strange side note to that: when the WikiLeaks documents came out. Mm-hmm. Part of those were a bunch of emails uh, uh, from various sides and, and, and parts of the government. And it proved that he actually had been communicating at length with John Podesta mm-hmm. yeah. about UFOs. Mm-hmm. And he had also been communicating with Major General William McCasland, uh, who is the commander of the Air Force Research Laboratory at Wright-Patterson, which – in, yeah, that, that's a big deal. That's yeah. that's like a big deal, right? Right. <laughs> and, and who who obviously is going to have access to highly classified technologies and, and and things like that. So when you're just about ready to dismiss this story, yes, you read these emails and you go, huh? And it's very important to note this this stuff all happens before we learn about the Pentagon program before it's publicly disclosed. Before it's publicly yeah. disclosed, correct. Wow. So he is promoting his book concurrently while he is – while is having these email exchanges with people that to his credit, I believe he did not identify this WikiLeaks thing, essentially identified it, Right. So when we have when we have Tom DeLong around this time period promoting his book and emailing Podesta, emailing at least one general that we know of, we also have, by his own account, a weird uh, a weird experience or run in in a hotel room. Oh yeah, I, I, this is another thing from the Rogan interview. He allegedly got interrogated. 
Oh, the interrogation, yeah. Yeah, on this subject by what what he claims were, I guess, CIA agents of some sort or intelligence agents of some sort. And he just got grilled for a couple of days, I think, is what his statement was. Really? He he, uh, he kind of resets the way he uh, he 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 terms the whole thing. Mm-hmm. At first he said, yeah, they had me there for two days. And then they go on to, well, I mean, of course I got to leave at night. Yeah. Uh, so it wasn't exactly, um, it, it wasn't exactly, you know, here's the glass of water and the swinging light in front of yeah, you yeah. and tell us what you know. It was, let's just have a long form conversation for a couple of days. I mean, I've been to conferences worse than that. Yeah, <laughs> it's true. <laughs> it's true. true. But they were, they did, keep him for two days uh, mm-hmm. in, in asking him. And he said they asked him questions like, um, how do you know what you know? Yeah. Mm-hmm. And oh, I can't tell you that. He, that would be his response to them. And he also did not or could not identify these people or the agency from which they claimed to originate. But but along the way, Tom DeLong, it's still Tom DeLong, and he's still getting – some kind of information that is in some way secretive. So, like so he's – just this whole pat- yes. time, they're giving him something. And just to reset, we're talking about the guitarist for Blink-182. Yeah. yeah. I'm just saying. Yeah. yeah. That's true. That's true. <laughs> Why are these people giving him this information? Why are they – if it's a giant wild goose chase that they're just kind of sending him down, is it mm-hmm. for funsies? Is it because each one of these high-level people was like, dude. The guy from Blink-182 showed up in my office and he talked to me for a while. Do you want to meet him? He really wants to talk to you. And everybody's like, yeah, I want to meet the dude from Blink-182. Send him down this way. John Podesta's like, bro, hook me up. I want to meet this guy. Right, right. Is that what's happening? Or is there something else going on here? Do you think he could do an acoustic set for us? I mean, (laughs) Well, well, you can meet him and you can get him to sign something. But the main thing is you have to – you have your in is to talk about UFOs. Yes. <laughs> the, 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 these heads of the DOD and CIA yeah. are going, oh, man, my kid would love it. Meanwhile, his, the kid is probably 40. But <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right. Jeez. So this is mystifying because you can see already where there are missing pieces of the jigsaw puzzle and where the various – claims about those missing pieces come into play, mm-hmm. right? Is is it a matter of necessary secrecy, as DeLong and the other uh, To the Star staff would say, or is it a matter of flim-flam, as many of the skeptics would say? We'll explore this further after a brief word from our sponsors, assuming we don't also get black-bagged during the break. Holy smokes, you guys, we made it. We're here. Go team. Yep, we're still here. Okay, so let's jump right into this. Yeah. According to Tom, the reason why he's been privy to this information and get in contact with all of these people is because he is providing them, all of these various government organizations, these intelligence agencies, he's providing them with a service, specifically communication. A platform through which... They can talk to the American people and I suppose uh, not so scary of a way and mm. where people, um, let's say, of our age, younger, will pay attention. So basically he's saying he has access to people that they don't have. Yeah. That's ex- that's exactly – that's exactly what he's saying at least. All right. And I will respond on behalf of – Uh, The various government programs that have existed since before the CIA that have effectively leveraged mass media in all forms to uh, gain support for otherwise controversial uh, objectives like wars. You're talking about propaganda, Ben. (laughs) Yeah. That's – it's just – okay. It is – incredibly easy to understand how someone could be skeptical about that claim simply because there is a preponderance of pre-existing evidence indicating that if Uncle Sam wants to approach the American public through controlled media and through uh, unacknowledged control of that media, not only is that a possibility, it's happened. It's It's like It's a thing they can already do. It's kind of like saying Ford factory approached me because I know a place where I can buy tires. 
<laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. It doesn't quite even out. Though I will say, if planes start going overhead, dropping leaflets with Tom DeLonge's face on them, I give up. I'm 100% <laughs> in at that point. Just go prone and wait. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, the, the first way which, in which he said he's taking or took the first mm-hmm. step mm-hmm. was writing the book Secret Machines Part 1. Yeah, the Ooh. series. Um, I read it. No, which one? The gods or no, chasing? The, 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 yeah, uh, is it Chasing Shadows? Yeah, Chasing Shadows. Yeah. What, what's your take, man? There are examples throughout history, recent history of books and also just people that try to tie all of the conspiracy theories, all of the mysteries together into kind of one uniform uh, a, a bad example is Bill Cooper with mm. Behold a Pale Horse. Yeah. That that's was super that, conspiracy. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's a real bad example, kind of a, a, a bad dude. Uh, but there's lots of examples of it. And he goes for it here. I mean, just a few of the topics that are covered in the book. Mm-hmm. Foo Fighters, not the band. <laughs> Speaking mm-hmm. of bands. Huh. Um, uh, Die Glocke. Mm-hmm. Oh, uh, the bell? The bell, uh, yeah. Uh, bell. Uh, uh, all about the bell. The bell is in there. So I'm assuming based on what Tom's told us, he must be saying that that's real. Mm-hmm. Um, also, side note, on Hysteria 51, we're experts on the bell. We did a show on it. Yeah. And uh, the Daily Express in uh, in England uh-huh. uh, wrote an entire article about the bell citing us as the experts. Nice. Wow. I, I'm like, man, oh, boy, you guys need better. But, I mean, it is tabloid. <laughs> well, yeah. can you <laughs> – can you hook us up? Look, I promise other than <laughs> this show and the millions of people who've heard it, this will stay just between us. <laughs> just take us to the bell. We want to see it. Oh, please. I'll, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll make a phone call. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right. But I've got to go to a Chili's at an airport to have the conversation, Ooh, so it nice. might take a while. Yeah. Uh, so, so he's – Hatching a meta conspiracy. Oh, yeah. Uh, cigar-shaped UFOs. Area 51, UFOs are there. Talks all about Operation Paperclip. Uh, talks about uh, metal not from this world that yes. is, is foldable but also indestructible. Mm-hmm. Uh, I mean, even even the, the Nazi escapes to Argentina, which to, a, to an extent have been proven, mm-hmm. but uh, on, a, on a much more mass scale. I mean, he hits it all. Wow. Um so, yeah, he, he's, uh, he's all in on all conspiracies, and they all tie in in this book. And that was the, that was the really interesting thing to me about the book. I mm-hmm. kind of thought that he would go with one theme and just drive it home. You yeah. know? Um, what happened at Roswell was a real thing, or Area 51, they really are doing stuff like that there. Mm-hmm. And, just, and, and then just take 700 pages, which it is. Um, to form the story around that. But no, I was completely wrong. He just goes all in the deep end. How's it structured? Yeah. Uh, it's uh, like a typical um, uh, mystery action book. Uh, oh, okay. there are There are characters, and uh, they don't know what's going on. There's a, uh, there's a member of the United States Air Force who has something happen um, – uh, in the sky that he can't explain, and all of a sudden uh, the CIA comes and recruits him to work for them, and he gets taken to Area 51. Uh, there is a woman who is a debunker and has a website debunking things, and she sent a mysterious package. There's a um, there there's a a daughter of a financial magnate who he dies under mysterious circumstances, and she tries to figure out what's going on. Mm-hmm. Uh, his alleged suicide wasn't really a suicide. Uh, so they really do. It's it's a it's a fictional book. It's a fun read. I I, I have no problem with the book. Yeah, it's what's implied behind the book. Uh, but the book itself is is enjoyable. It sounds like uh, multi platform IP. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and you said it's a you said it's a series, right? Yeah, I think the second one is not out yet, but coming out this year, uh, uh, a fire within. Yeah, uh, secret machines, a fire within. Interesting. So. The, oh, and just really yeah. fast, there's yeah. another one called Gods, uh, Secret Machines, Gods, colon, volume one of Gods, Man, and War, which is kind of an introduction to the whole series, apparently. So Secret Machines is its own universe, right? It's being created that way, yeah. I started in the wrong place. Man. No, I don't I don't know. I honestly have not read any of it. I was just looking at the Simon & Schuster website, nice. and uh, that's where they were talking about that one. So 
one thing that is always in the front of my mind when I read meta conspiracies, that's that's just a made up term for any book that or any belief system that tries to combine three or more of what we call single conspiracies. Sure. So one of the big questions I always have when I read one of those books, like Behold a Pale Horse, which I think you mentioned Cooper earlier, is how the hell are you going to pull off a sequel? You know what I mean? Like, what else are you going to take? David Icke is uh, masterful at that. I don't know how he does it or what spreadsheet he uses or how he keeps track of the things that he is adding in with successive books or reexamining. But I'm already very interested to learn what else comes up in A Fire Within and as as you said, these are works of fiction, but they are, by the admission of the co-author Tom DeLong, they are meant to serve as a doorway, a gentle introduction to something that he believes and his colleagues, we would assume, believe is absolutely true. In fact, the uh, when the LA Weekly interviewed him, mm-hmm. they asked him a pretty simple question. What makes secret machines different from other works of UFOlogy? And DeLong said, there won't be any disinformation in my project because I'm talking to very high-level people. That cannot be identified. That cannot be identified. Well, some of them can because we can only assume that he was working with a lot of the people that ended up on the core team of To the Stars Academy, which includes Tom DeLong, the chairman of the board. Right. And uh, he's not on the Academy, but he was also working with, we should say, his co-writer, A.J. Hartley. Yes, to mm-hmm. write both both versions of Secret right. Machines. And right. then there's another author who did the the other – the third book. So who's on this core team to the Stars Academy? It's not just him, right? Oh, yeah. The VP, Vice President of Operations, is a retired CIA officer and member of the Senior Intelligence Service named Jim Semivan, S-E-M-I-V-A-N. You can look him up a little bit. There's a little you can learn about him. Uh, has a has, He's had a long career as a spy, and yeah. now he's the VP of operations at this company. Another really interesting guy is named Steve Justice, which, by the way, awesome name. Yes. Yeah. Uh, uh, he's part of the aerospace division. He was the director for advanced systems at Lockheed Martin in their advanced system development programs. Uh, that's also known as Skunk Works. Yes. That's the legit UFO stuff. That's the guy. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> which is which is amazing because you would have to – one would have to imagine, right, that his, his bar for what he considers worthwhile in this field must be extraordinarily high. One would hope. One yeah. Would hope. <laughs> yeah. Hope is a better word. <laughs> unless, unless this is like a retirement option. Like I'm just going to – have some fun over there at the To the Stars Academy. Right, right. Or make some money. Yeah. The other guy that I uh, I mentioned earlier, Luis Elizondo, who was the who was the head of the ATIP program, the the secret program in the Pentagon. Mm-hmm. Uh, he's he's now part of the To the Stars Academy as well. He's the director of global security and special programs. Yeah, and he has a massive, like you said, background in human intelligence, counterintelligence. Uh, I mean, when you work for the DOD in that way, it's – and you're at that high level, I'm interested to know how much his job is some kind of, mm-hmm. I don't know, uh, mole in a way for, you know, for intelligence agencies right. just to see what this group is doing. Yeah, that's that's one of the unanswered questions. It always pops up or it's never answered to people's satisfaction, which is, is there a threshold of of authority within the government, a threshold of position after which you never really quit or retire, Mm. right? Like it doesn't – you know, an easy example would be the president of the US. Once you're in there, whether it's for four years or eight, for the rest of your life, no matter how long or short it is, your opinion still counts for (laughs) a massive – it doesn't even matter what you're talking about. You could go – you could go on Twitter and say Burger King is the best one. Yep. People wouldn't even ask what you mean. Would, would you just, <laughs> like? Are you talking fast food? Are you talking burgers? It, it, it's weird because you never really retire at that level. So one of the questions is, and I think this is what you're getting at too, Matt. Like, is Elizondo retired? Yeah. Can he? 
Yeah, could he retire? Now, he says, according to him, he left the Pentagon because there are real threats out there that need to be investigated and they are unwilling to do so, which um, – at least part of that smacks of true. Mm-hmm. When you hear that, that that project, the ATIP project, had a $22 million budget over the course of, what was it, seven years? Yeah. That is – that's like the toilet paper budget at the Pentagon. Yes. Mm-hmm. Like that is a very small amount of money. $740 uh, billion or $50 billion right. that they get a year? On the books. <coughs> <Yeah>, exactly. <laughs> um, the, my only wish for Elizondo, I've mm-hmm. seen him on numerous interviews. You can go find them on YouTube right now. Get Don't talk about of, his facial hair. His it's so weird. <laughs> it just it takes away from his credibility. It just uh, he looks like a guy that would believe this stuff. Oh, <laughs> oh no! But he also has I don't know. There's a there's a certain badassery about it too. But I I, I see what you're saying, John. <laughs> I just I, I I my my co-host on our show when we mentioned that he also disagreed with me. <laughs> uh, just, could, <laughs> could you all describe his hair for anybody who hasn't uh, hasn't seen a photo of it there's a youtube video you can watch on the to the stars youtube academy site uh we just recommend you watch that it's very short it's an introduction to him as a character and you get to see it in its full glory it maybe the best way to put it i want to see if you agree okay okay um guy fietti only it's gray with a soul patch oh wow i could totally see that did he have frosted feel. tips, though? <laughs> yeah, I, <laughs> I can't remember if he did. I, I don't I, think he had that. <laughs> I think it was gray, but okay. uh, the I think the soul patch part is what is yeah. it, is that what's throwing you off? I think so. Yeah. Well, we we know though that he does have his bona fides. Yeah, and, and we yeah, haven't even talked about the most fascinating character yet, in my opinion. Who's that? That is Doctor Hal Puthoff. Is it Puth? Puthoff? I thought it was Puthoff. But um, Puthoff? I, I assumed Puthoff, Puthoff as well. Okay. But yeah. okay. Puthoff? It's Dr. Hal Puthoff. He's the vice president of science and technology. And do you guys know anything about this dude? Uh, just the bare bones, but I, I think I know which parts of the skeleton you're going to unearth. Well, okay. Here's the, here are the facts. Uh, he has a PhD in electrical engineering from Stanford University in California. That's the the Stanford with accolades, one of the top schools in the United States and probably the world. Right. Um, in the 1960s and 70s, he reached OT level seven uh, inside the Church of Scientology. Right. Um, he did. He ended up leaving the church in the late 70s. Um, so he, he acquired a lot of thetans. He did. And one of the things that he alleges he learned. Ooh, technically, he's cleaning his thetans out. Oh, yeah. Right? Oh, uh, you know. Uh, okay, sure. <laughs> um, Can I say that on air? Yeah, <laughs> Is sure. that a, too much of a spoiler? Sure. Okay. Uh, but he did leave the church. But one of the things he says that he learned how to do whilst you know going through the programs there was how to remote view and what remote viewing is and how to achieve it. And then that helped him work in the 70s and 80s on a little thing that we mentioned earlier called Project Stargate, <laughs> uh, where – you know, that was the uh, Central and Defense Intelligence Agency's attempt to prove that psychic powers or paranormal powers of some form or another sure. uh, could be used for national security. And we've we've got a whole episode on that. We've talked about it before. Fascinating stuff. The Men Who Stare at Goats. Yes. It's worth it. Uh, check it out. Really just fascinating. Um, but yeah, so he was a pioneer in these techniques that Project Stargate used for remote viewing. And he looked at Yuri Geller in, spe- in specifics and a couple other guys who he and his colleagues truly believed had psychic powers of some yeah, sort. I think Ingo Swan might have Ingo been Ingo Swan was, one. was one yeah. of them. Yeah, you're right. Um, he also founded the Institute for Advanced Studies at Austin – as well as Earth Tech International Incorporated, which have now formed one single thing. And the mission statement there is short enough for me to read in verbatim. So it says, shaping the future by innovating breakthroughs that inspire new modes of space transportation and new sources of energy. So again, a lot of the similar things that the the Academy is trying to achieve. 
So they were good bedfellows from the get-go. Absolutely. But, yeah, they're perfect bedfellows because this is a guy who believes you can truly remote view who, you know, their their ESP and other powers probably and they can be applied. Or at least believes in research. It believes there's sure. enough indication there. Careful what you say though. He might be watching right now. Yeah, uh, <laughs> yeah absolutely. <laughs> He's oh jotting this down in a closet somewhere. Oh, boy. It's a long table. Um, there are a lot of – Looks like a spider, maybe with the ends are puffy, and, and they're talking into them. <laughs> right now, you know, there, there's very fascinating argument there, which is that if something like that were to exist, then of course you would want it to be discredited because if if there was such a thing as effective reproducible remote viewing and it was being used for various aspects of statecraft. And what's the first thing a rival country does? Kills all of those people. As quickly as possible, international law be damned. Mm. So maybe I'm just – I'm trying to brainstorm reasons or, you know, I'm trying to brainstorm motivations to keep that from the public were it to be true. But when you say the academy, one thing that's really interesting is you're not talking, Matt, in some vague abstract term. You're talking about specifically to the stars academy – and we learned some stuff about that, right? Because it is uh, like many things in our society, regardless of its aims, it is driven by a financial engine. So wh- what do we know about that? How, does, how do the numbers work for this thing? Well, and, and when they did their big debut on stage, they talked about a lot of lofty goals and aspirations and basically doing things for the good of humanity. And then they ended with donate here. Um, and that's what that's essentially what it was. You can buy quote unquote stock because it's not like traded on the stock exchange, but quote unquote mm-hmm. stock of uh, of to the stars academy. It's five dollars a share and uh, minimum two hundred dollars spend. They've had two thousand something um, uh, purchasers so far. Oh wow! And have already as of I should say as of March of this year had raised two point five million dollars. Wow. That's nuts to me. From 2,500, 2,509 individuals according to the website. Minimum donation, $200. So to get to 2.5 million, that means some people were putting in everything. A lot more. Yeah. A lot more. A significant chunk of change. Including huh? Tom, right? Yeah. Oh yeah. He To get it off the ground, he invested 600000 of his own money. Ooh, okay. And as a function of that, he now makes a minimum of $100,000 per year in royalties from the company to become whole again. Mm. Oh, okay. So just to recoup. Yeah, I, now I don't know if that will go on beyond his his recouping of the funds, but right. Um, you know, and obviously, being a private company, all of this is just what they choose to share. Right. Yeah, it is up to them regarding how much they want to disclose, and, and more so than it would be if they had like a, a public stock. Correct. Right. So. It's fascinating. Whenever we bring money into this, many people can easily feel as though it invalidates the organization entire. That's not necessarily true. I can see where that skepticism comes from, but the the two things are not automatically related, right? You have to have funding to do your projects. Ask, Ask NASA. Right. Yeah. I, I mean, everyone at NASA has been complaining about the, the shrinking budget there for 30 years. Yeah. yeah. Ask our sales department. <laughs> very true. <laughs> so what? Uh, what? So when we talk about these projects, what? What exactly are Tom DeLonge's claims? What kind of stuff is to the Stars Academy funding? What's the research? What gives? It depends on if you want specifics or if you want very general. Specifics, yeah. numerous movies, books, mm-hmm. um, and, and various forms of other, uh, uh, of other materials that they will sell for profit. Mm-hmm. If you want very general, uh, the other aims are to develop technologies, to reveal information. Okay. And like, well, that sounds really generic. Mm-hmm. Yep. Yeah. That's because that's all they've said. <laughs> yeah. Oh. Uh, but you – whenever Tom talks about it, he's like, you won't believe it, man. Like the technology that, that they've exposed me to, it's it's just amazing or told me about. Yeah, you can shoot a laser at this metal and the metal will somehow generate energy yeah. and float. Mm. Uh, time travel. Yeah, time travel, dude. And it's very specific. 
He got crazy specific about the time travel. Yes, he did. How so? Oh, he says there's um, an artificial bubble of gravity that gets created when you're using one of these machines. Uh And then everything else outside of that bubble freezes, essentially. Everybody everybody says, freeze. And then the bubble can move throughout, like, time and space. And you could pick up a Coca-Cola can out of John's hand, put it in Ben's hand, and then uh, just leave. And then, I guess, turn it off. And then time would go back to normal. And there would be a red shift. There was like a, a visible red shift when you're operating the thing. Uh-huh. Well, my guess has to be that it must operate on red mercury. Oh. <laughs> like the bell. Dude. Yeah. And sure. it, that's, I, I assume that's why there would be a red shift. That's, that's probably what it is. It's time travel. Man. And also, if you're going to make the greatest discovery in the history of humanity, which yeah. that would be, the first thing you obviously would do – would be start playing practical jokes on people with Coca Colas. Yeah, that's what right. I mean. Yeah. Right. <laughs> yeah. I, I, the other thing is, you know, not to get too in the weeds about it, but the bubble concept is difficult because it sets a threshold for where the flow of time differentiates. So, how could you reach outside of the bubble? How could you take that from the coat from one end to the other? Are you somehow in? Okay, you know what? It's a different show. It's a different show. So that's one of those claims. If the person's hand holding the Coca-Cola entered the bubble, right, in order for you to manipulate it whilst inside the bubble, Mm -hmm. what happens to that hand? Would it be like that remake of The Time Machine where he – spoiler alert. Guy Pierce. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Yeah. Where he gets in a fight with the head Morlock and then like – they age precipitously when they're outside of the bubble. I'm going to watch it again. You come, <laughs> you, you come back with a hand that is just a skeleton. Yeah. Ooh. yeah. That was not – that practical joke was not worthwhile. I yeah. want my $200 back. Yes. Yeah. And if you are doing, you know, practical jokes with stuff in hands, I got to say I think switching out guns for bananas is probably the best. That's what I would do. Couldn't agree more. So we talked about some of the other things that he believes, as you said, John, that the Roswell material recovered was from a German-manufactured vehicle. Well, an Argentinian-manufactured vehicle, (laughs) right, by a German scientist in exile. Yeah, that's that's what he said. Um, And specifically that Project Paperclip is about a lot more than what we think it's about with the same basic goal, get the top scientists from Germany to work for us rather than let's say for Russia or somebody else. But he thinks – and he would not say what it was but it was about something else. They knew how to reverse engineer some of this technology. They were more – they were more in tune with and advanced with the alien technology than we were and that's why we have to go get them. That's why we gave Werner – Von Braun, the house in the Hamptons. Yes. Yeah. And said, here, this is NASA. (laughs) (laughs) Want to run it? (laughs) Yeah. So these are already what we call tall milkshakes. It's kind of a tall order to uh, accept this fundamentally without a higher degree of proof, right? You can see videos aplenty. We're all familiar with YouTube if we listen to podcasts. But if there is some sort of unidentifiable alloy the, from, that was recovered from a crash site, then the logical assumption is that more people would believe you if that were made public and available for study. But these are not all of the claims. There are a couple of more things that he believes, correct? Oh, yeah. Well, I mean, we can get all to all of them, but he, it's obvious that Tom DeLonge in some way, at least personally, believes in a lot of YouTube UFO videos or aerial threat vehicles, uh, videos of them that exist online, videos that as a video professional or at least a former video professional, um, you can easily see our After Effects projects. Right. Um, Pretty easily. And I think people are more discerning now about a lot of these things with Photoshop. You can kind of tell when something has been manipulated, but if someone's really good at it, it's harder to tell, but you can still see motion shake in there or someone specifically uh, blurring an image on purpose at a certain time. He he believes in this thing called the TR3B Astro, which has been shown in, gosh, countless videos. He showed one on the Joe Rogan experience. He did. And it was obviously fake in my opinion. And that kind of thing doesn't do a great job of boosting your credit. 
I guess, in this sphere for me, at least in my opinion. Sure. Um, and the other big thing is the um, the moon missions, the Apollo moon missions. Yes. Yeah. One thing on the um, video that he showed yeah. on Joe Rogan, not only did he say he believes that, he inferred that a technology similar or perhaps exact um, is going to be uh, revealed to the world through the To the Stars Academy um, imminently. Yeah. Really? Hasn't happened yet. Not yet. And that was, I don't know. 2016? At maybe? least a year ago. Yeah. Uh, has, But it hasn't happened yet. Hmm. Yeah. Well, and then there's the whole thing with the Apollo moon mission. He He believes and he stayed in and I think – They've discussed this before that the Apollo moon missions were successful. They were real. The problem is this whole disinformation thing about the moon landing being faked. It was propagated by these same control forces that he believes has been kind of trickling out disclosure over the years. Mm -hmm. Specifically because they didn't want the public asking questions about what they found on the moon. While they were there. Yeah. I see. Okay. So it's the – it's the larger pattern of the accepted things or the rumored things are true but with a twist. Yes. There's always a new twist on this. So these – we're we're just touching a little bit on some of the claims and you can find many of these claims in further detail in different interviews, several of which have actually been apparently pulled from uh, the net and they're kind of tough to find now. Uh, but this leads us to several conclusions or guesses. The big question is what what next? What does this mean? Where does this all go? And with that, John, I, I, I think we'd have to defer to you. What do you think, ma'am? What do you, where do you think this is headed? To, to understand where it's going to go, I think first you have to look at – um, what he's actually doing and understanding his motivation, uh, if we can. And to me, there's only there's three possi- three basic possibilities there. First, he's completely telling the truth. We are um, we're just a little too skeptical here, but he's he's on the money, and uh, e- 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 E.T. has been here, and he is the agent of disclosure for the government. Okay, that's option one. Option two is the flip side of that coin. He is completely lying. He is in this for the money. It is a for-profit business and he is going to profit and really use this to extend, further extend his IP, hmm. his, uh, you know, his, uh, his, his books, his movies, um, et cetera. The third possibility, which I find intriguing because we have talked about his connections, it is nuts the connections that he has, the people he's had meetings with, and mm-hmm. even the people on that board that we mentioned earlier. It's kind of crazy. How does he get access to those people? And so for me, the third possibility is he is an agent of disinformation. And this would not be, as I'm sure you've talked about on this show, the first time that real disinformation has been in the UFO world. Not – not uh, – not tinfoil hat type of, oh, we think the government's behind it. Mm-hmm. No, proven out. I mean, look back at Paul Benowitz. Yeah. Uh, Paul, Be- if, if, if your listeners aren't familiar with the story, to make it a really, a really long story short, essentially he was seeing aliens everywhere. Um, but he actually – he stum- accidentally stumbled into some real classified programs. And they're like, well, we need to, we need to throw them off the track. So they, they incorporated two guys, uh, Bill Moore. Uh, who wrote a book about Roswell, actually, uh, and Richard Doty. And they started working Benowitz and saying, not trying to steer him away from the UFOs. They're trying to actually get him away from the secret real project and started telling, you're absolutely right about aliens. And their mission was to drive him insane, to drive him Looney Tunes. And they succeeded. He spent the preponderance of his life after they created all of this fake evidence Mm -hmm. in in and out of uh, mental facilities. Yeah, And that was... I, Bill Moore, the guy I mentioned earlier, literally at a MUFON conference in I think the late 80s, came out and said, hey, everybody, I have been an agent of disinformation on behalf of the CIA, but it's it's all good because I was doing it so I could learn more. Yeah. Um, these are all – these are all <laughs> really – these are all real things. These yeah. aren't uh, – these are proven out. These are you know admitted to things. Are we looking at Tom DeLonge as Benowitz all over again and he just doesn't know it? I – I'm going to go ahead and say, in my opinion, I think that's probably closer to what's happening, because if you look back, the Richard C. Doty thing that that 
is a story that stuck with me since our Stephen Greer interview because he he posits that that guy he has that guy under control and he knows you know how this guy manipulates and he knows when he's telling the truth and and this Richard Doty would never lie to him and all this stuff and I feel like when you get too deep into this world and you feel like you're down that rabbit hole to a certain extent and like far enough then how can you tell when someone is being honest with you or not mm. I mean I I think it gets really confusing and I have a feeling that Tom DeLonge is, has found himself somewhere, again, just my opinion, in that gradient of like, not sure who he can really trust anymore. So he kind of has to just go with it. When articles of proof become replaced by matters of trust or articles of faith, essentially. Yeah. Right? It's a dangerous thing. And it's easy if, – if this is true, it's easy for people on the outside to look at this askance and say – well, sure, maybe to someone else that would happen, but never to me. The problem is that when these sorts of things occur, it's never a light switch. It's always a matter of gradients and increments and degrees. It's a trickle. It's yeah. a trickle, right? Like the spread of disclosure, right? <laughs> oh, uh, boy. So <laughs> this this brings us to one of the most important questions Folks, we would like to hear from you. What do you think about this? Where do you think this is going? What do you think about the possibilities that John has raised? Would you say that there is something else there? Do you have a definite pick? Is this guy definitely lying on purpose to you and the public at large? Is this absolutely true? Is he being lied to and used? And, and if why so, why yeah. are those other people working for him? Yeah, that's yeah. the part I can't get over. I, I just if it's not if it's not disinformation, mm -hmm. what that's the most intriguing part of this story to me. The reason I wanted to talk about it yeah. is these are skunk works. Yeah, he's part of this to the stars academy. It, it's just crazy. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, I the only thing that I will go on record saying as in my own personal opinion is that I feel like they could have chosen a much better name. To the Stars Academy sounds like a knockoff space camp. <laughs> That's it is a little weird. It's kind of long. It feels like it should have a more singular iconic name because mm. eventually, you know, maybe it's going to be a giant corporation. That yeah, it sounds, yeah. It sounds like the kind of place where everybody gets a participation medal. Right, oh, right, yeah. Dang. Pick a scary name that could also be a venture capitalist company yeah. or something, you know, like uh, something that sounds powerful but made up. Like the car name for a V8, you know, to call it Vidapurian or something, you know, <laughs> people, people would be into that. Well, speaking of participation, hey, John, thanks for being on the show with us today. This was a lot of fun. Guys, thanks so much for having me. This was great. I've been, I've been listening to this show for much longer than we've been doing ours. You've... Uh, the show has been an inspiration for our show, and uh, and I, it was such a pleasure and a thrill to to get to sit down and 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 talk through uh, Blink One Eighty Two with you. <laughs> and, yeah. yeah, thank you for bringing Conspiracy Bot on as well. Uh, again, we would like to recommend Hysteria Fifty One. If you enjoy our show, uh, do please head on over to John's show and check it out. We often run into some of the same things, but we always, as shows, uncover different facets of information. We will take it in different directions because there are so many paths to travel here on the edge of the known world. Yeah, you can check out episodes that John and Brent have done on remote viewing, Gray Aliens, Area 51, Roswell, The Battle of Los Angeles. I can go on. Uh, if you like this episode, go check that out now. Battle of Los Angeles especially. That's a good one. Oh, yeah. We, the, the entry point for a lot of people on our show is we did a two-parter on the Flat Earth. Mm, nice. And we had two, two of the uh, YouTube experts on Flat Earth. Mm. But we also had a guy from NASA, a guy from SpaceX, and, a, um, and an astrophysicist. Ah, nice. Excellent. And it was three hours of pure torment for me, not oh. just being able to call them names. But uh, <laughs> people enjoyed the show. So where'd you end up? Definitely Flat? Oh, completely. 100%. Okay. Yeah. Uh, although I can't figure out how it's both flat and hollow, so I'm just going with both and, we'll, you know. Yeah. <laughs> it's like a Reese cup with the peanut butter taken out. Got it. Oh. And it's slowly moving down in a screw-shaped fashion. 
the on the back of a turtle. On nope. the back of yes, it's a tortoise, but well, that's fine. Oh, you, <laughs> you can. That's <laughs> why. You, that's why you guys are the professionals. Oh boy. So, John, where can people uh, learn more about Hysteria Fifty One? Well, obviously, it's available on any podcatcher. So, just search Hysteria Fifty One. If you want to go to Facebook, we have a discussion group where we talk about all of this stuff. It's uh, it's called Hysteria Nation. So, you would just search Hysteria Nation. But if you can't remember any of that, just go to our website, Hysteria Fifty One dot com. Great. And while you're online, you can find us at uh, Instagram, Facebook, Twitter. Check out our community page. Here's where it gets crazy. You can hear more from the most important members of this show. That's right. You and your fellow listeners. Uh, And full disclosure, Matt, Noel, and I are active on there as well. You might see us uh, dropping by making a comment, uh, especially on, on memes for some reason. Yeah, that's our favorite one. <laughs> Posing questions, finding new stuff for the show. So yeah, find us on Facebook, Twitter, Conspiracy Stuff, Conspiracy Stuff Show on Instagram. You can go to StuffTheyDon'tWantYouToKnow.com and check out every episode we've ever done, our videos, all kinds of stuff. Or just, you know, find us on the podcatchers. That's fine. And that's the end of this classic episode. If you have any thoughts or questions about this episode, You can get into contact with us in a number of different ways. One of the best is to give us a call. Our number is 1-833-STDWYTK. If you don't want to do that, you can send us a good old-fashioned email. We are conspiracy at iHeartRadio.com. Stuff They Don't Want You to Know is a production of iHeartRadio. For more podcasts from iHeartRadio, visit the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to your favorite shows.